Okay, we're going to continue on with our Moving Forward series. And uh, previously we talked about who are we, why, and uh, what are we here for. And today we're going to talk about where are we going? Where are we going? Well, you know, many of us start out on a vacation, and I'm sure most of us know where we're going. Nobody kind of just gets up and says, okay, let's go on a vacation. We don't know where we're going to go. We'll just get in the car and go. But if you're like me, you not only want to know where you're going, but you want to get online and go to, like, MapQuest or one of the other map things and print out turn-by-turn -turn instructions on how to get to where you're going. I want to know where I'm going, how long it's going to take to get there, and if it's a long trip, I want to make sure I can stay at a hotel or motel along the way. And the same is true, really, for many areas of your life, because you have to set a goal, you have to map out a path, right, in order to reach that goal, and you have to keep following it until you accomplish the goal that you set out to do. And that's really common sense. If you want to achieve something, you have to know what it is, first of all, and you have to figure out how you're going to get there and then follow that path and, and reach your goal. But for some reason, when it comes to church life, we don't think that way. Instead of mapping out where we're going as Christians, we tend to just go around in circles. Well, yeah, we probably can do some great things when we're going around in circles, but we need to break out of that cycle and begin heading in a certain and specific direction. Why do we need to do that? Well, because God has a lot of things that he wants us to accomplish while we're here in this life. And we can't accomplish that until we know where we're going. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at five things this morning that we can say about where we should be going as his church. Now, number one, we should be heading towards the harvest. We should be heading towards the harvest. Now, I'm not into agriculture, but I do know that when you plant a crop, you do so for the purpose of being able to harvest it. Otherwise, why plant it, right? Why put all that effort into plowing the field, planting the seed, fertilizing, watering, and everything else that goes into this, and then never harvesting the crop? But unfortunately, that's what happens in our churches today when it comes to our spiritual harvest. You see, God has planted a desire within the hearts of people to know Him, and many of those people are just waiting for somebody to come and harvest them by letting them know how to come into a relationship with Christ. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. John 4 and 35. It says, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Verse 36. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. Now, what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? So it's time for us to begin viewing the world around us as a field of people that are ripe for the picking. They are in need of harvesting, and we have been commissioned by Jesus to be a harvesting crew. Amen. Our roadmap as a church is defined by the harvest. We should be headed in the direction that Jesus has told us to go. And, and guess what? He promises that it won't be a waste of time because the fields are ready and they're ripe. They need to be harvested. The leadership of this church is taking Jesus' instruction seriously. And we need to get out there and harvest these people. Matter of fact, our purpose statement begins with, it says, to help lead those who are not yet Christians into fully devoted followers of Christ, equipping them to reach their full potential in Him, not just ours. 
I like to refer to these people as not yet Christians rather than non-Christians. They're just Christians waiting to be Christians. The unchurched are the people that we need to harvest, turning them into fully devoted followers of Christ. And that's what really evangelism is all about. And that term, equipping them to reach their full potential, is really our mandate to teach these folks how not only to become strong Christians themselves, but to equip them also to reproduce their faith in others that are waiting to be harvested. So everything we do as a church should be built upon the foundation of our purpose, which is God's purpose. So in other words, if something we're doing does not help us fulfill our purpose, uh-oh, it's something we shouldn't be spending our time and effort on. Amen? Amen. Our resources, our time, our energy, and our prayer need to be poured into turning unchurched people into devoted followers of Christ, equipping them to reach their full potential. That's what church is all about. Nothing else. Amen. Number two... We should be gathering like-minded people. Gathering like-minded people. <clears throat> Let me illustrate this. This little girl was staying with her grandparents. She was five years old. <clears throat> and she pulled some corn on, on the neighbor's farm for the first time because they lived in an agricultural area. And her grandparents used the experience as a teaching tool explaining that the corn was God's blessing to them. Well, at first, uh, the little girl started harvesting some of this corn, and she thought it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> but then after a few minutes out in the field, the little girl looked at her grandmother and said, Grandma, you know, you can buy this stuff at the grocery store. Didn't you know that? So what happened? Well, you see, the little girl had picked up on the fact that harvesting is hard work, right? Not everybody wants to get involved. They want to take a shortcut. Forget about the harvest. The tragedy is that many people in our churches share the, that little girl's work ethic. They don't want to do any work to get the harvest. They expect the harvest to just come to them. Oh yeah, we want to enjoy all the activities at churches, the programs, times of worship, bake sales, Easter egg hunts, and a thousand other non-related activities. <clears throat> but when it comes time to do the harvest that God has commanded us to do, we don't want to get our hands dirty by actually going into the harvest field. Why? Why is that? Because doing what Jesus has called us to do it is some hard work it might cause us some stress <clears throat> uh oh it might take some of our time it, it might cause some moments of heartbreak there might be times we want to give up it's not as much fun as sitting and listening right to actually go out and do some work but we need to realize and embrace the fact that when the harvest comes in, I said, when the harvest comes in, when we see people who are formerly far away from God coming into the peace and security offered them, then we can understand why that effort was really worth it. Evangelist Billy Graham, he said, every generation is strategic. We are not responsible for the past generation. <clears throat> And we cannot bear full responsibility for the next one, but we do have our generation, and God will hold us responsible as how well we fulfill our responsibilities to this age and take advantage of those opportunities that God has put in our course to harvest. Yes, Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, listen, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. See, on one hand, we're seeking to harvest the unchurched or those who are not yet Christians. 
And on the other hand, we're praying for more people who are already Christians, right, to help us <clears throat> out in the harvest field. Can't do this by ourselves. We need help. So no matter where we're at in our personal life, we are wanted and needed by God's church. He needs not only people that don't know him to come and hear the word, but people that already know him to help others to come and hear the word. So we're not asking people to sign up for a social club, but to join the most important task that has ever been given and needed in the world. What else are we doing? We should be sharing <coughs> words of grace. Sharing words of grace. <laughs> because as we go out into the harvest fields, we need to have something to tell our friends, our neighbors, our associates, and our BFFs, what the new term is, right? We need to have words of grace that will let them know that God loves them. <clears throat> and guess what? Every person matters to God. Here's a message from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, right, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead, and it is only by God's grace that we have been saved. We need to share those words of His grace to others. <clears throat> Our job is to tell other people that God loves them, and that they'll simply no rocket science, simply repent of their rebellion against him and accept his free gift of salvation with no strings attached, right? they'll be in a relationship with him forever. <clears throat> the next thing is <clears throat> some important truth statements. If you remember these, it'll help you along your harvesting way. Number one is True statement. You'll never <clears throat> meet anyone who is not the object of God's love and concern. There's nobody you can meet from now until all eternity who is not the object of God's love and concern. Why is that? Because he created everyone, didn't he? Does a father and mother love their children? Yeah. <clears throat> Number two, you'll never meet anyone who does not need what you have in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so with these true statements, who is in the harvest field? Everybody. So you can't say, well, I can't find nobody who's right for heart. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Everybody is the object of God's love. Everybody needs what we have in Christ. <clears throat> so there's nobody then that's not ready for harvest. And if we keep these two statements in mind when we leave our house in the morning or when we go to the store or when we walk through the mall or we're just kind of kicking it, right? We'll soon begin to see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Because that's how he looks at us. I need you to come to me, son. And when we begin to see people in this way, we'll begin to find ways will come up with ways to share the words of grace that God has given us. And if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Romans 10 and 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14 says, But how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless somebody tells them? It's right there in God's Word. Verse 15. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the Scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Jesus has sent us into the harvest field. And as we map our direction out as a church, we need to know that each, each of us is willing to be that person who gives that message of grace that Jesus has given to us. 
But it's only going to happen when you and I make the commitment to be that person who will tell them the good news of God's grace. Now what else is going to happen? Number four, we also need to be fighting a what? Spiritual battle. <clears throat> Because in all of what's going on, we need to be aware that there's a spiritual enemy who's fighting against our efforts. And they don't want to see the harvest come in. They want to kill the crops. Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against each other. But against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. The spiritual world. Against mighty powers in this dark world. Against evil spirits in heavenly places. <clears throat> so what does it tell us to do because of that battle that we're involved in? Verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after battle, you will still be standing firm. Why is it that when you want to tell somebody else about Jesus, you get scared? Why aren't your friends thrilled when you want to share words of God's grace? Why do you think the church as a whole hasn't made more impact on the world of those that don't know Jesus? It's because we have an enemy who doesn't want us to succeed. Now we have the ability as Christians to fight off the enemy. But we get lazy and let him control what we're doing sometimes. Or distract us. We have to be aware that Satan is scheming and working against us every moment. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Stay alert. Watch out for that enemy, your great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. Well, what does it tell us? Doesn't matter. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same suffering that you are. It's not something to be paranoid about, but it's something to be aware of. Amen? You see, every day we need to be aware of the fact there's a supernatural force trying to stop our efforts. And I see that it's present right now. Right? Amen. Yep. And we need to come against that force and the power of our faith with the power of prayer. What else should we be doing? We should be letting God's Spirit lead us. When we first came to Florida, we took the auto train and we, we drove towards Sarasota. And along the way, there was an accident on the, interstate, on the interstate and it was closed down. So not being familiar with the area, I turned on my GPS unit and it selected an alternate route to get around this monstrous road closure. And then we started traveling down these little country roads and it, it seemed like we were going in the wrong direction. I said, this can't be right. And I was tempted to say, change the direction and go the way I thought it would be to get to the other side of where this accident was. But, but I continued to rely on the GPS unit and then after what seemed like an eternity, long drive through all this unfamiliar territory, all of a sudden the interstate appeared again and it was past where the accident was, we got on it, and we were able to finish our trip. And I say that because my experience during this trip reminds me that if I try to take control and go down the road of life without the direction of the Holy Spirit, which is God's GPS unit, amen, then I'm going to end up in the wrong place. I have to rely on God's Word and His Spirit and not be tempted by the enemy to travel down the wrong road. And I think that's a good lesson as we travel on our spiritual journey. Many times we say yes to God's purpose as a church when we're headed for uncharted waters. And we know that being obedient to the Lord often leads to turmoil sometimes, sometimes disappointment, and sometimes persecution. 
But we commit ourselves to stick with him no matter what because we know that God is the pilot and he knows where he's going and where he's leading us to. Romans 8 and 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So we've got to open ourselves up to the Spirit's leading, amen, as we walk down the path that God has sent us out on. Otherwise, we're going to be off the road and in trouble. And when we do that, we find comfort and strength in knowing that He's going to lead us to places we need to go, not where we want to go, and people that we need to meet. What it really comes down to is a matter of trust. Do we believe that God is really God and that He knows what He's doing? But we believe in the GPS unit, that man-made thing in the car, right, to get us where we want to go. How much better it is to believe in God who told people how to design that GPS unit, amen? And if we answer yes, we will trust in Him, we'll follow His direction for our lives in our church, then we're headed in the right direction. You know, in our society today, we see all kind of visual images. And apparently we become blind to the images of spiritual significance. We don't need to travel far to find people who have ignored symbols pointing to God. Virtually every town in America has some kind of uh, old church with a steeple and a cross on the top of it. But how many people as they're driving down the street each day stop to consider what that cross really means? I would say not very many, if not all. But the people who pass by are not to blame because they need something more than a symbol to lead them to Christ. They need you and they need me. And when we do that, we'll be following the direction that God has mapped out for us as His church. So our hope and prayer today is that we're willing to be part of a team as we move into the will and the wonder of following God. Let's pray.